everybody, welcome to First Baptist Church of McDonough, our downtown campus. Welcome back. We hope that you have had a great week. Maybe you're listening to this on a Friday night. Maybe the week is almost over for you, or maybe it's Sunday morning. You're there on the couch with your family and your coffee. I'm a little jealous, I must admit, but we are so glad that you have tuned in with us whenever and wherever you are. Hope that your life is blessed this very week. You think about what Jesus said and what is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or what is echoed by one of the New Testament writers that was writing to the early church. We find that Jesus was often talking about the kingdom of God, how incredibly important it is. At times he would talk about the kingdom of heaven. And so it's, it's very important for us as followers of Jesus that we get a good handle on what this whole concept of the kingdom is all about. You and I are free people. We love the fact that we are not subjects of a king or a queen. And there are many in those places around the world where there are kingdoms that do enjoy the monarchs. It's far and few between. And you and I, of course, crossed the pond because we wanted our freedom and fought a valiant war to gain our freedom. But we're, we are, as followers of Jesus, though we are free people, we are indeed subjects of the kingdom of God. Now, we serve an almighty king. We serve a benevolent king. We serve a king who loved us so much that he sacrificed his son to save our souls from hell. The Bible tells us that we have been lifted from the darkness and brought into the glorious light of the kingdom of the Son He loves, meaning God the Father. Disciples, very curious about the conversation that Jesus was having with Almighty God in heaven, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And there was another occasion on which Jesus was preaching to a crowd of people on a plateau of a, of, of a hillside. We call this sermon the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, I want you to pray like this. And the very first things come out of Jesus' mouth when he's teaching his disciples to pray is our Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Luke chapter 18, our focal passage today, keying in on verse 16, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples about all of the children that were coming to him and parents bringing babies to be blessed by Jesus. And this really got under the skin of some of the disciples. And they said, Lord, we do not have time for this nonsense with babies and kids. <laughs> Jesus scolds them quickly. He said, unless you have the faith of a child, you will not enter the kingdom of God. So today what I wanted to do is talk about kingdom faith, how incredibly important it is. Jesus said that we must take hold of the kingdom of God. And we do that not with human hands, but with the heart of faith. With the will to believe that causes us to move into action. Now that's actually what faith is. It's not a concept, but it's more of an action. In fact, faith is to the Christian what a foundation is to the house. I heard about this family that was having all kinds of foundation issues on their house. And every time this group of men would come out and they would repair another section of the broken foundation under the house. Finally, the boss of this group of men that was preparing these foundations said, you know, I don't mind coming out here to keep on fixing these cracks, but what you really need is a brand new foundation. And that's kind of what Jesus is saying. Without the faith of a child, without simple, 
childlike faith to believe. And by believe, move. Exercise your faith. You will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, my dear friends, how with all of my being, I want you to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is now. The kingdom of God has come. The ultimate fulfillment of the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God in heaven. The final destiny, the completed building project that is our lives and that is the ultimate place where we are going. I want you to be a part of that. First Peter, the old King James says that as followers of Jesus, we are a peculiar people. He also says we're a royal priesthood. We are the family of God. What unites all of us is our faith to believe that Jesus shed his blood and died on the cross and that through grace we have, or rather by grace, through faith, we have received the gift of eternal life and having done so, entered into the kingdom of God, out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the light of the Son that God loves. The Bible tells us we were once at enmity with God. We were separated from God. We were at odds with God. But because of the faith that we have and because of God's grace, we were granted a brand new life, a life built on a brand new foundation, a foundation and in a kingdom not built with human hands, but, but by the creator of the heavens and the earth, making this an incredibly important endeavor that the kingdom of God and us and our involvement in it shouldn't just be something that occurs every now and then for us, Sundays at 11 a.m., which is when most Baptist churches meet. No, this should just be something that is always surrounding us, that is in and through us, that is our life's essence, our life's goal, our life's mission. It's to advance the kingdom of God. And how do we do that? By faith, we do these things. Say this with me, because you know this. Without faith, finish it for me. It is impossible to please God. Let's look at that passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 18, shall we? We're going to pick up the reading in verse 15. People were bringing babies to Jesus for Him to place uh, His hands on them. It's kind of a Jewish rabbinical blessing. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. Hey, stop doing this. But Jesus called the children to him. And he said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. For I tell you the truth that anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child... shall never, ever enter it. Today I want to talk to you about this faith that we must begin to exercise in our lives in order to continue in the work to which God has called us to carry out the mission of the church to advance the kingdom of God in this world which has come to this world. Something incredibly important. I've got just three little points I want to share with you this morning and I, or, or whenever you're watching this. And I, I think they'll help kind of put the pieces together for you, for me. I think they'll maybe help uh, give us some handles on which to hold as we think about this childlike faith. And that without it, we will not see the kingdom of God. We will not have part in the kingdom of God. We will not be a part of the eternal kingdom of God. 
we will not please God without this childlike faith. Well, one of, one of, like, what does that mean? I don't want to necessarily talk about what faith is so much as I want to talk about what faith does today, maybe. And the first of this is there is a willingness through the faith God is giving us to persevere to the end. Our Presbyterian brothers and sisters make a huge deal about that. In fact, it's one of the tenets of the Calvinist uh, idea of, of, of theology. It's the uh, reformer's theology. One of the very big points that they make on this acronym called TULIP, the very end, is to persevere to the end. I hate it when our Presbyterian brothers and sisters are right. They, they certainly have that right. That when we are given faith in God, when the Holy Spirit of God comes into our lives, He goes on to do the work that He intended to accomplish in us. Sometimes for you and me, He drags us kicking and screaming. We don't want to do it. We don't want to be a part of it. We want to take the easy route. We want the easy road. We just want to have our eternal life insurance, but we don't want to carry out the kingdom work. But it is those who persevere to the end, who feel the presence of, of the Spirit of God working in their lives to work in and through them, to help advance the kingdom, to, to help share the message of the gospel. Maybe as awkwardly as you share the gospel, God can take care of all of that. Maybe you don't feel like you have something to offer to the church or to God's kingdom. My dear friend, you do. That's why God saved you. Those who are truly a part of the kingdom of God are they who persevere to the end. Now, that probably means at a time or two, maybe in your life, maybe you've taken a detour, right? You've kind of lost your way. Maybe you took the scenic route and you just sat up on top of the hill and sat it out for a while. Your faith lay dormant. That faith was real as the day you received Jesus as your Savior and Lord. For once the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to do His work, He's not leaving till it's done. He may let you sit it out on the sideline for a while because maybe at times you need to get off the field and catch your breath, right? Maybe sometimes you take a detour and you're kind of quenching, you're kind of stifling the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That happens in all of us. We all fail. We all fall. But true followers of Jesus also get back up off the ground and get moving again at some point in our lives. Maybe you're there today and you're saying, you know what, I have been sidelined, Pastor Charles. Maybe COVID-19 sidelined me. Maybe I've been sitting it out. Maybe I'm getting way too comfortable on Sundays on this couch. Maybe it's time for me to come back and be a part of the kingdom work of the church. Well, I hope you arrive at that conclusion because it's true. We love you. We want you. We need you. Whether that's our church or the church down the street, we want you physically present and involved. And we're glad we can have this conversation with you through this video cast. But you can't persist or subsist just exercising your faith on the couch Sunday at 11 or whenever you're watching this. You've got to get up and keep moving. I remember many years ago, 5,000 pastors from all over the world gathered in Orlando, Florida, and we had a very special guest one evening, a Hollywood actor, director, producer of, of great films, Mel Gibson was there, and he took the stage and he began to talk about his completed project called The Passion of the Christ. It hadn't been in theaters yet, but he showed it to all of us. We all sat around in, a, in, a, in this massive megachurch for about two hours and watched the film that evening. It was just unbelievable. Never seen anything like it. Mel Gibson said of he and his fellow actors and those involved in the project that he asked them all to a man, 
to a woman point blank, face to face, are you willing to completely sacrifice your career and give all of it up for the cause of Christ? Because this project may be that opportunity. Because it's not going to be popular in Hollywood. And everyone on the project said we're willing to do just that for the great cause of portraying Jesus on film. And the rest was kind of history. They were willing to persevere. Bible tells us, an old Baptist hymn reminds us that we ought to be standing on the promises of God. Well, too many people, my dear friend, are merely sitting on the premises. Their blessed assurance is, is, is almost welded into that pew. And it's time we get off our blessed assurance and we get back in the game. We get back on the move. And for so many people, this global pandemic, has, which caught all of us off guard, continued to keep all of us off our game. And by game, I mean the work of the kingdom. It's time to get back up and into the ministry, persevering through the ups and downs of all that we as a church on two campuses are trying to accomplish, what Southern Baptists are trying to accomplish in North America and around the world. It's a difficult work. Sometimes it requires great sacrifice, but oh, my dear friends, the dividends are eternal. We want you to be a part of it. You look at Hebrews chapter 11. One day this week, go read it. You'll, you'll be astounded by what many of the great people of faith in Scripture went through. We, we like to remember all of their great successes, but we also know that many of them, most of them rather, were horribly flawed people, just like you and me, and maybe worse. But what they all had in common, and, and it's sort of, Elevated in Hebrews chapter 11, it's, it's kind of spotlighted, is that they all had faith that moved them into action. It was a faith beyond themselves. It was a kingdom faith. In verse 4, we see Abel. In Abel, we see faith worshiping. In Enoch, verse 5 and 6, we see faith walking. In Verse 7, we see Noah and his faith working. In chapter, excuse me, verses 8 through 22, we read about the patriarchs. And for many of them, it was faith waiting for the fulfillment of the promises of God. But they weren't waiting around doing nothing. They were waiting for the promises to be fulfilled by being active in their faith in the day to day kind of blooming where they were planted. And in fact, the, the great crescendo of chapter 11 uh, in, in the book of Hebrews says, and by the way, most of them didn't even get to see the promises fulfilled, and yet they had faith anyway. In Romans chapter 4 and 5, we read about Abraham where it tells us that his faith was credited to him as righteousness, not his works, mind you, but the faith that he had that led him to do the work to which God had called him. You and I aren't saving ourselves by the good works we do. We're coming to God through faith and by his grace. He saves us because of the blood of Jesus, his death and his resurrection. But then you and I go on to accomplish the purposes of God, to fulfill the work of God, to advance the kingdom of God, like I've been saying, exercising the faith that He gave us. In verse 30 and 31, we read about Joshua and Rahab and others who went on to claim the promises of God, taking the land of promise God had offered them. We see faith winning. even goes on to say that there are others of a different kind in verse 36, a whole new category. We don't even know what that means. It's probably a reference to his church that was yet to form. 
yet was being formed. But we must never conclude that the lack of deliverance equals the lack of faith because that might not be true at all. When all hell breaks loose around you, it may be because you are doing every single thing right. You are exercising your faith in God. You are trusting Him to see you through. You are persevering to the end. You are accomplishing great things for God at great cost to you and under great opposition. We're living in a world where the Christian faith is facing greater and greater opposition. And I don't see that shrinking. It may. But not presently. Second thing I want to say is that it is the faith to believe, though it is not visible, right? We, we could read more about that in Hebrews chapter 11, which I really encourage you to read. Faith is believing the things that are yet to be seen. And there's a prophetic word from God that this is going to occur, but it hasn't occurred yet. But what do we do? We go on and exercise the faith that it has already occurred because when God says it's going to occur, it's no longer a prediction, it's a prophecy. It's going to come true. So when Jesus says the kingdom is near, and then he goes on to say the kingdom has come, and then he says the kingdom of God is advancing like we read a couple of weeks ago. And then we see that the kingdom of God will find its ultimate fulfillment when it becomes the great kingdom of heaven. The final destiny of all who put their faith and trust in Christ to have everlasting life. The work of the kingdom is accomplished. Our salvation was accomplished on the cross. Through the beating, through the blood, through the death of Jesus. He was physically raised from the dead to prove that he had victory over life and death. And then he sent us out into the world to accomplish the work of his kingdom. The scripture says, by the way, that until the last one has heard the gospel, Christ will not return. But when that one does, it'll all be said and done. And the kingdom of God will have been accomplished. The church will rise up victorious. No, Christian faith isn't blind optimism. The Christian faith isn't one of those, gee, I really hope all this comes true kind of faith. It's not an intellectual assent to a Christian doctrine. It's, it's not believing despite all of the evidence, which seems a bit insane. No, 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 no. It is trusting that whatever God says will come to pass because God never lies. This happens to us all the time. We're in a Bible study class. We're uh, hearing great music worship on Sundays. We're hearing a message from God's Word. We're listening to Christian radio or we're watching one of the great preachers of the faith preach on television. We're reading a, a Christian book that kind of gives us better insight about the Word of God or we're just simply reading the Word of God for itself, which is, by the way, the best book ever. What is happening there? Well, God begins to speak to us through His Word. And then we hear his word. Oh, by the way, the scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then we accept this word. We trust in this word and then we act on this word. Faith is throughout it all. The faith to hear, the faith to understand and gain the wisdom from it, and then the faith to act upon it. That is kingdom faith. It perseveres to the end, mind you, and secondly, faith to believe, though it is not visible. That's that second part we're talking about. If we fully trust our invisible God, then we should live more purely. We should give more sacrificially, more generously. We should trust more wholeheartedly. We should love unconditionally because that's the way God loves us. We should hope 
without any reservation. Thomas refused to believe until he saw the risen Christ. Jesus said to Thomas, you're so blessed because you get to see me, but think of all those who are going to believe and act on their faith in me, yet they have never in their lifetimes seen me. Final thing I want to say, we'll wrap this up, is that the confidence and assurance to exercise our faith. That's really where the rubber meets the road, and that really is the hardest part. We can all read and say we're reading by faith. We can all attempt to comprehend and claim that we understand it. Maybe we do. But it's not until we act it's not until we exercise our faith in God does it become clear that we indeed, in fact, have a confident assurance in God. That we have a trust that is moved into operation. Many people have disappointed you, disappointed me, Life circumstances maybe got in the way. Some even lost their faith in the process. It's so heartbreaking when I see people lose their faith in God. I've seen it over and over again. I've seen Christian pastors do the very same thing. So they themselves are not without fault for sure. In fact, sometimes it's in the process of ministering to people that pastors lose their faith. Not in the world, not in people, but in God. What a shame. Makes me wonder whether they had it at all because they're abandoning their faith altogether. Now, it could be a sidetrack. It could be a sideline. It could be a scenic route, a detour. Or maybe they drop it all together and maybe that's the proof they never really had it. But here's the thing. Christ will never let you or me down, ever. What people have done in God's name, oh, that lets us down. That disappoints us almost every week. But what Christ has done for us, what He's proven over and over again for us, God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. Jesus willingly went to the cross to save our souls. And He will never let you down, no matter what you face. But you and I, when it comes to what we face, we must exercise our faith to keep on believing, to keep on trusting, to keep on having that confident assurance. Legend has it that a man was lost out in the desert and just as he felt he could no longer carry on, he stumbled across an old pump. He grabbed the handle and began to pump. Up and down, up and down, nothing came out. But he noticed nearby, nearly covered in sand, was a dusty jug. He shook it and he realized Oh my heavens, there's liquid inside. And so he dusts off the label and here's what it says. There's just enough water in this jug to prime the pump. Be sure to fill it again after you've had all the water you can drink. The man was suddenly faced with a very perplexing problem. Do I just drink what little is in the jug? Or do I give all of that water to the pump and attempt to prime what might yield water seemingly unending? With great faith, he poured it all down the well and he began to pump. Nothing happened at first. But all of a sudden, he could feel it from underneath him in his feet that water was rising up and he drank the most wonderful cold water from deep down below the dust and sand. He drank all that he possibly wanted and he filled the jug for the next thirsty one who would come along behind him. Faith dares us to ask the impossible, to dream the impossible, to do what is seemingly impossible. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And without faith in God, we probably won't accomplish our goals and dreams we establish for ourselves.
But with God, all things are always possible. If we have the faith to believe. And if we have the faith to trust God and step out and exercise it. Faith is not reserved for an elite group of believers. It's for every single one of us. And some might even suggest that some have gotten so sporty about their spiritual faith that they can just look like they have faith even though they may never have it. But God sees us. And that's who we're wanting to please anyway. But without it, without faith, it will be impossible to please God. Well, that's the encouragement I wanted to give you today. I hope this has been inspiring to you. I hope it's been challenging too. The Word of God should be. The disciples, they got a rude awakening that day. Jesus said, guys, you've been with me so long and you still don't get it. You and I, we must exercise our faith in a Heavenly Father above us. We must be about His business, doing His will, accomplishing His task, advancing His kingdom. For without it, we'll never please Him. But as we exercise our faith, we certainly will. God bless you. Have a great week. We hope to see you back here really soon.